My friends, welcome to the Bible Project Daily Podcast. I'm back at home again, so hopefully the sound quality should be a bit better than it's been these last couple of days. We're continuing our journey through the entire Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And today, we're midway through our journey through the Old Testament book of Numbers. Today, we're going to look at the entire chapter 13 and see what it can teach us about how we look at life. Some people say you can divide the world into two types of people. There are those of us who see the glass as being half full and those who see it as half empty all the time. Another way to say the same thing, I suppose, is that people generally tend to have an optimistic or some other people have a pessimistic outlook on life. Now that's important to understand because in a sense, the way you look at life determines what you actually do. I know that that sounds like an incredibly simple thing to say, but I find in pastoring and supporting people, particularly people who are struggling, I've noted how repeatedly their perception of what's going on isn't really what's going on. People trapped in an overly pessimistic outlook on life really don't have a correct perception of what's really going on and how they can approach it. Sometimes people just need to be helped to look at the reality of the situation and what they really see and what's laid out before them. Then they can begin to make progress on solving the problems that bother them, whatever those problems may be. So I think the basic principle is in fact true in life and it's also true in the spiritual life. That the very fact that who you are and what you see determines what you will do spiritually. And I think one of the great illustrations of this is found for us in today's chapter 13 of the book of Numbers. Now of all the material in the book of Numbers, we're now coming into sections that are probably the most well known, best known parts of the story revealed there in it. If I were to mention Numbers and say to people, tell me what happens in the book of Numbers, I think the average Christian would probably struggle to be able to to say what actually happens in it. But those that could, I suspect, would probably mention the events that we're going to describe, particularly in this chapter and in a few that follow. So with that in mind, let's have a look today at Numbers chapter 13 and see what it can tell us on how we should approach life. And welcome to the Bible Project Daily Podcast. As I said in the introduction, I think this there is an incredibly simple lesson to be found in this passage. But I think even though it's pretty straightforward in what it says, it's actually quite a profound truth. The first part of the passage, in fact, the first 16 verses, are just a straightforward command that the Lord gives to Moses. Moses is then in turn seen to commission those people to go and carry out that command. And to do that, they are to go and spy out the land they're planning to enter into is describing how they are to comply with the commission that they've been given. So I'm just going to start with the command that the Lord gives to Moses. And let's look at the first couple of verses where it says, the Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the Israelites from each ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders. Notice it says its leaders, not the leader. Anyway, this section covers the initial command given by the Lord, which involves sending out 12 spies, one from each of the 12 tribes. Now, while these opening verses do not explicitly mention it here, later we discover in the book of Deuteronomy, we learn that the children of Israel actually requested of the Lord to send spies into the land first. So, When reading that passage in isolation, it might raise the question, when they request to send spies, is that a form of disobedience? Rather than simply agreeing to go forward into the land, as God had promised, they opted first to send these spies to scope the place out. Now, I consider the command spies 
when reading it, we're not reading it in isolation and knowing that Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 22, it actually is, states that the children of Israel made a request. It indicates that the Israelites are not really rebelling against God here. They're just hesitant. They're lacking confidence in God's guidance. And the fact that God permitted their requests suggests to me that he didn't in fact consider their action out and out disobedience. It was just a lack of confidence, if you like. And if we connect the opening verses here of Numbers 13 and align them with Deuteronomy chapter 1, we can see the Israelites' request and they gained God's permission to do things in this way. So the plot thickens as we move to the next verse, which says, So the Lord commanded Moses and sent them out from the desert of Paran. All of them were leaders among the tribes of Israel. These are their names. From the tribe of Reuben, Shamua, son of Zakur. From the tribe of Simeon, Shephahat, son of Horai. From the tribe of Judah, Helab, son of Jephune. From the tribe of Ishakar, Egal, son of Joseph. From the tribe of Ephraim, Hoshea, son of Nun. From the tribe of Benjamin, Hatti, son of Rephu. From the tribe of Zebulun, Gadiel, son of Sodai, from the tribe of Manasseh, which is a tribe of Joseph, Gadai, son of Susi, from the tribe of Dan, Amael, son of Gamalai, from the tribe of Asher, Sether, son of Michael, from the tribe of Nephtali, Navi, son of Pophpishi, from the tribe of Gad, Geoel, son of Mekai. These are the names of the men Moses sent to explore the land. Moses gave Hoshea, son of Nun, the name Joshua. So there's two important ones there, particularly. Verse 7, Hoshea, son of Nun. And from verse 6, Caleb, son of Jephunneh. Now, if you recall earlier in the book of Numbers, when we started it, we had a list of the names of the leaders of the tribes given. Here's another one of these lists again, but this list differs from the earlier one. The earlier list given in chapter 1 and was of the heads of the tribe. And there are leaders chosen here from out the tribe in chapter 7. But these, however, are different set of names. These are people who are designated as having the giftings of being spies from within each tribe. Apparently, they're chosen not because they are leaders in a military sense as such, but because they perhaps had some sort of special personal abilities to do this job and then as as we need to point out in verse 16 that this guy Hoshea the son of Nun has his name changed to Joshua I'll come back to that in more detail in a minute but at this point we just see that Moses changes Joshua's name from Hoshea to Joshua which is the Hebrew word for God is salvation his former name being Hoshea simply meant salvation but by naming him Joshua God has revealed that he is the one who will bring salvation, and that's significant. I'll touch on that again in a minute. But in these opening 16 verses, they're nothing more than giving us, than first of all showing us that God gives the command to Moses to set out the spies. We now know that's in response to the request that was made. And then the next verses, through to 16, list that out for us. But then in 17 through 20, we see Moses giving the specific commission to these spies and what they're to do, which tells us this. When Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said, go up through the Negev and on into the hill country. See what the land is like and whether the people who live there are, str are strong or weak. Few or many. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or fortified? How is the soil? Is it fertile or of poor quality? Are there trees there or not? Do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land. It was the season of the grapes. That's added in a parenthesis in a paragraph. Now, that's a pretty comprehensive job description. However, basically it boils down to two main things. Moses is telling Joshua and the others, I want all of these spies not just to go into the land, but I want them to look closely at the people and the condition of the land itself. That's the commission. 
Then he says to him in verse 20, do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land, pointing out the fact that it was the season of the grapes. So by telling us that they're to bring back fruit of land and noting also that it was the season of the grapes, it gives us an idea of the time of the season when they were in there. It's going to be around about the time when the grapes ripen and appear, which means it's likely they entered into the land, these spies anyway, in July or August, around about that time of year. So, okay, that's the commission. The next part of the passage sees them fulfilling and complying with that mission. 21 to 25 tell us, So they went up and explored the land from the desert of Zin as far as Rehob towards Lebo Hamath. They went up there through the Negev and came to Hebron where Ahiman, Sheshai and Talmia, the descendants of Anak lived. Hebron had been built seven years before Zor in Egypt. When they reached the valley of Eshkol, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them carried it on a pole between them, along with some pomegranates and figs. The place was called the valley of Eshkol because of the cluster of grapes the Israelites cut there. At the end of 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. So they go in and they explore. And verse 22 tells us they go from the south and they come to Hebron. And then some of the cities around Hebron are also mentioned for us. Then in verse 22, it says this, Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. Well, why would it want to emphasize that? It actually picks that out. It even tells us that not only was it built, that it existed before Zoan in Egypt. So what's that all about? Well, Zoan at that time was the name of the capital city of Egypt which is where they had started out from on their journey. And we know, actually, that Zoan was built around 730 BC. So what this is simply saying is, look, this place has existed for a long time, even before Zoan it was built, seven years before, in fact. Now, we also know that Hebron is an important place, not just because it is established for a long time, but it is an important place in the salvation history of God and the people uh, and the nation of Israel. Most people today don't know as much about Hebron as they do about other places in and around the Holy Land. Most people have heard of and know about Galilee, Jerusalem, of course, even Jericho as well. Samaria figures widely in people's minds as well, but Hebron? Hebron, not much so much so, but Hebron is a very important place especially in the Old Testament, right from the very earliest parts of Genesis. For example, it was at Hebron that God promised to give Abraham the land, and that was way back in Genesis 13. And it was out of Hebron that Abraham set out to defeat the coalition of the kings in Genesis chapter 14. And in fact, it's the only piece of uh, real estate, so to speak, that God gave to Abraham that he actually possessed in his lifetime. And in fact, of course, he's buried there. So this is a very significant place. Even later than that, we see it will become David's capital before he actually conquers Jerusalem and makes that his capital. It lies actually just to the south of Jerusalem. I'd also like to suggest this is where Joshua got his name changed and this ties it all together. His name was changed from the basic name, Hoshea, which means salvation or deliverance, to Joshua, which means God's deliverance, Jehovah deliverance, God will save, ensuring that the salvation, although going to be utilized through him and witnessed through him as an individual, it must never be confused and thought came about or through the man himself. It was God who wrought the salvation plan for the nation of Israel and beyond himself through Hosea, now named Joshua. And all this is going is happening, and we are and specifically happening to remind the people that all of this is happening at the point where God originally gave his land to the people by revealing it to Abraham. They knew that. They knew that this was where it happened, and they knew that this was where Abraham was buried. So the spies are crossing these historical markers, so to speak, as they go through into the land. 
Verse 23 is interesting as well. It talks about them collecting grapes, doesn't it? And you think about a cluster of grapes as we'll often see them today in the supermarket. But this draws attention to the fact that this cluster was so big that when they cut it down in the tree, they had to get a pole and hang the cluster of grapes in the pole with two men on either end of the pole to carry it. So this is meant to show that this is a huge cluster of grapes, one that's so big it's almost mind-boggling. And just as an aside, this is happening in the area, remember, just north of Hebron, and that region today is still known for its grape. And in fact, the symbol in Israel has come to stand for agricultural productivity. It's a popular symbol used to this day. If you go to Israel, you will see this symbol of two men carrying a pole and between them a huge cluster of grapes. As a matter of fact, it's the logo today for Israel's Department of Tourism. Anyway, I digress. It then tells us in verse 25 that they returned from spying out the land after spending 40 days there. So the trip into the land took 40 days. So at this point, I've just mentioned three things. Firstly, God gave a command to Moses. Secondly, Moses gave that commission to these people identified from each tribe to go in and spy out the land. And thirdly, these spies are seen to comply and complete the commission that God, through Moses, gave them. Okay, we got it up to that point. Okay, let's get back and see what sort of report they give based on what they've seen and done. And verse 26 is where it tells us. It says this. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Piran. There they reported to them, to the whole assembly, and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land of which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is the fruit of it. But the people who live there are powerful, and their cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites, they live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live near the sea along the Jordan. So here's the report. And I mentioned that the commission originally given, remember, consisted of two things. Go tell us about the land and tell us about the people. And the report generally follows that outline, doesn't it? In verse 26, we see them showing the fruit. And in verse 27, they do indeed describe the land and say that it flows with milk and honey. A phrase that has entered the popular vernacular, hasn't it? So they did, in a sense, do exactly what Moses told them to do. They gave their report concerning the land. But then there was an addition, a second part of the report, where they said, the people are strong, very large, and they have fortified cities. By mentioning one of the particular tribes, they're pointing out that some of the descendants of these people are believed to have been descended from giants. So the complete report includes all these various nationalities that you see mentioned at the end of these the verses I read as people who currently dwelt in the land. But the basic idea here is that they're saying, yeah, the land is beautiful, Yes, it's bountiful, but the inhabitants are dangerous. Now, I need to stop there and make a comment. The last verse I read, verse 29, lists all these people that you've heard about in the Bible before, haven't you? The Canaanites, of course, were the original indigenous inhabitants of the land. So they were there longer than anybody else. But the Amorites, they entered Canaan from Syria around 2000 BC. And they drove out most of the Canaanites, certainly out of the hill country, and they took their place there. The Hittites, they originated from what we today would call central Turkey. And they entered in about 1800 BC and slowly spread south and so southeast. The Jebusites are also mentioned, and frankly, we don't really know anything about their origin, except that they entered the land and remained in control of Jerusalem until David will eventually drive them out and capture the city and make it his capital, in an experts estimate around about 1004 BC. Now, the point of all this and all these people is to say they came into the land 
Why did they enter in? Well, because it was beautiful, because it was productive. Uh, but the purpose of saying all these people are there and that they've come in and conquered, what they're saying is these people are there and they're not going to give up this land easily. They fought to get it and I'm sure they plan to keep it. And that seems to be the idea they're adding into the mix of this report. But then we see an addendum to report as given by one of those named, which is Caleb. So the two significant people in this passage are Joshua and Caleb. Listen to what Caleb says. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack these people, they are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land that they explored. They said the land we explored devours those living in it, and the people there are of great size, giants. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak who came from Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. So ten out of these ten spies said, yeah, well, the land's beautiful, but at the same time, we don't want to go there. And we don't want to go there because we can't conquer that place. And the children of giants live there. But Caleb stands alone and says, we can not only do it, but we should do it now immediately. Let's get up at once and claim the land. But the men who had gone with him, the other 10 of the 12 spies say, we're not able to go up against these people. They're stronger than we are. In fact, these people are of giant stature and we were like grasshoppers in their sight. So the response is the majority report, if you like, says these people are huge and they live in four to five cities and we can't do this. We are wandering pastoral people with no ability or resources to go up against people like this. Remember, all these various groups came in and conquered the people who lived there previously, so they were already stronger than the original inhabitants of the land. Interesting to just note that this word used here as describing them as giants is exactly the same word used in Genesis chapter 6. You may remember at the beginning of the flood they said there were giants in the land, and this is the very same word. Now the point of all this is that the commission for them that they were given was to go in and view the land and report back what they saw. That was the commission, remember? But what did they do? Well, they not only told what they saw, but they also told what they thought they could not do because of what they saw. But that was not their job description. They went over and beyond that. They put their interpretation on what the reality of that might look like and felt like to them. So it ties back with what I said in the future. You see, when at the command of the Lord, Moses commissioned 12 spies to survey out the land, one man, Caleb, and you could say Joshua as well, they felt the glass was half full and they could indeed conquer the land and conquer it immediately. But 10 believed that the glass was half empty and it was impossible for to conquer the land because of the people who were there. And that's the sum and the message of the story. It's straightforward from a narrative point of view, but I do feel we need to make a couple of observations to draw out what it means for us by considering the standpoint, the two different standpoints of this majority of 10 spies and the minority of Joshua and Caleb. Now, the first thing I have to say is that on one level, superficially, the 10 were right. In fact, there's one very famous Old Testament historian called H.E. Friend, and he actually pointed out and wrote about how the Assyrians actually invented this thing we now today call siege warfare. They built massive machinery and had what were called, we would today call engineering cores, and they would use this machinery to undermine and, and eventually bring down walls and subdue walled cities. It took them many years to conquer the land in that way, but conquer it they did. So from a human point of view, Israel was indeed faced with a formidable task and a formidable flow. And this group of the main group of spies, they pessimistically maintained that the task of conquering that land was impossible because of the unfavorable odds they faced. Now there is a sense in human terms, of course, that they were right. 
This was indeed a huge challenge, and it was indeed, you might say, beyond their human capacity to do it. The second observation I want to make about these ten spies is the fact that, in another sense, they were in fact very, very wrong. So what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is, is they told what they saw, but they didn't tell the whole picture. What did they leave out of their thinking? Well, there are several things they should have picked up along the way, and the most important of which, of course, is that God has already promised to give them the land. They should have been reminded throughout their spying and all the way in going up heaven that God had made this promise. The very fact that Moses had changed Joshua's name from Hosea to Joshua, that should have reminded them of the fact that God also was going to do this and had promised to do it, and it was by his power and might that he would do it. They left all of that thinking out of their report, which meant in doing so, in reality, they didn't see the total picture. Now, if you put this story back into the context of the book of Numbers, We've already seen that there's been steps along this path of negativity, hasn't it? We see how they've spurned God's provision in the very recent past. In fact, remember, just in the last couple of days, they didn't like the manna, and they said they wanted meat. They got quail, and they didn't like that. So they've already sneered at God's provision several times along this journey, even within the first few days of setting out in it. And now we have these ten spies, and they're disbelieving as well. They're interpreting things negativity. They're leaving out God's promise that he would in fact give the people the land. And they are reckoning only on their natural ability, and they're failing to consider God's supernatural ability when compiling their report. The ten spies, the majority, didn't want to Israel to enter the land because ultimately they felt humanly inadequate. In this, they were in a sense being realistic. However, they should have compensated for their feelings of personal inadequacy by reminding themselves of God's complete adequacy. And isn't that what we are all to do? Whatever you're struggling with, whatever you feel is insurmountable, you should allow God to compensate you for your own feelings of inadequacy by reminding yourself of God's complete ability to bring you through. God was teaching the Israelites a very basic life lesson here, namely that real power, friends, lives in the lives of anyone who surrenders their life to God because God himself lives and empowers them. And as we choose to trust and obey him, the promise of scripture is he will release his power through us. We may indeed be inadequate in ourselves, but that shouldn't make us depressed. That shouldn't give us anxiety. That should simply allow us to grasp hold of the fact of the promise that God will empower the obedient and those who trust in him. Jesus Christ himself taught the very same lesson, didn't he? When he multiplied the loaves and the fishes, for example, and when he actually said to his disciples, without me, you can do nothing. Paul also wrote about this in his letters, saying things like, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So when you look at a situation, when you look at the land or the people that you are dealing with in your journey, in your life, you don't need to just look at your ability to, con to conquer the obstacles that come your way. You should be looking at the Lord, at his abilities to make up for your inadequacies, to give you the giftings you need to conquer the challenges. So don't get me wrong, the report of the spies was factual in the sense that it said the land was fruitful, but also pointed out the cities were fortified and that the population was mixed from all these different conquering tribes in different ways. But Joshua and Caleb, they of course not only had exactly the same facts, but they had faith on top of that. They had faith that God had promised them the land and that because God had promised them the land, they could indeed take it, therefore they should press forwards. Now as Christian believers, I believe we're called to walk by faith in that we are still called to constantly face up to the problems and the struggles that meet us. 
and that we should see those as a series of great opportunities, sometimes disguised, brilliantly disguised, as what seem insolvable problems. May I repeat that because I think it's important. Even in the Christian life, we are continually faced with a series of great opportunities, but brilliantly described as seemingly insolvable problems. But they are solvable, friends, no matter what you're dealing with, no matter what you're struggling with, they are solvable, but they're only solvable when you trust in what the Lord can do and press on forward in the knowledge that he has promised to enable you to do it. Thanks for being with me here today. Okay, that's it for today. We'll actually carry on in this vein yesterday when we'll consider what the opportunities that present themselves when you finally reach one of those big turning points in life. So I do hope you'll come back here again tomorrow and be with me in our journey through the book of Numbers. I'm going to remind you that this podcast is free, freely available on all the main podcast networks. And you can subscribe to it wherever you're getting your podcast from by simply doing that there. That way you'll get a notification every time a podcast drops. And that way you've got no excuse to miss another single episode. That way you're joining with me on this amazing journey that one day, Lord willing, we'll get all the way from Genesis through to Revelation. Now you can follow along at whatever pace works for you. You can even go back if you're a newbie to the very beginning and work through all these episodes up to this point and complete the entire project. Whatever works for you. Now there are ways to reach out and connect to this ministry. The main one of doing that is by becoming a patron. Now you don't have to financially commit to financially supporting the ministry to be a patron. But over there, there's a community where people can communicate with me and also can access lots of free bonus episodes and exclusive material that I'm doing all the time, every week, that doesn't actually fit within the main Bible Project podcast. Just versions or notes, summings up of stuff that I'm doing in my everyday life during the week. I'm always out at least once a week, sometimes two, three times a week, speaking in secular environments, trying to bring the message of biblical Christianity into places and meeting people at their points of interest. If those meetings and talks are recorded, I make them available on Patreon, or if not, I tend to pull them together as some notes in my preparation or a press of what I've said that evening and make it available over there. You can see all that stuff on Patreon. There's also a new button going on the actual podcast host website, which is the Bible Project at buzzsprout.com, where you'll be able to click and ask a question or just reach out with some encouragement there. There are also links to places like social media, LinkedIn, YouTube, places like that but I tend not to enter into communication with people on Facebook with so many thousands of people around the world watching this and listening to it. It's pretty quickly became impossible to deal with the communication on Facebook, which as many of you knew will probably know when utilizing social media, it's a very hard place to discern the genuine interested in seekers from those with other agendas. So anyway, the main thing is the Bible Project Daily Podcast, where you listen and study the Bible with me, together with me every day, and it's free for everybody every day. I do have another history-based podcast, which is a history of the Christian church, which is going up one episode every three or four weeks as I can fit it in, which exists to actually It's been put on totally in the history section, not in the Christian section, as a way of trying stepping over and introducing people to the story of the Holy Spirit working through the lives of all the great figures in history 
in the history of the Christian Church chronologically. So we're about seven, eight, nine episodes into that. Check that out if you're interested in that as well. And I'll leave it there for today. Thanks for being with me. You know, there really wouldn't be any point in me doing this at all if it wasn't for the fact that there's so many out of, that there's many of you out there who are allowing the study of the Bible to become part of the rhythm of your daily life. And that is the reason. Lives I know are being transformed through that. And that's the reason I'm doing this. And I'll keep on doing this for as long as a Lord enables me to. So thanks for being with me today. I do hope you'll come back again tomorrow on the Bible Project Daily Podcast. Bye-bye for now.